let's turn back to Ephesians, the first chapter again, to continue our look at the second chapter now, the way here. Second chapter of Ephesians, and um, start with verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses of sins. I want to clarify an important point in regard to this. At what point did we become dead in trespasses of sins? Personally, individually. Did we become dead? Did we become dead? Did, did we, at what point did we become dead? Right, when Adam sinned back in the, like in the Garden of Eden, and the sinful inheritance or death inheritance has been with us ever since. Let's go to Romans, the fifth chapter, to confirm this point. Romans chapter 5, and first of all, verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, death through sin, and, and thus death but spread to all men because all sin. So, by, by how many men did sin into the world? Only one, his name was Adam, of course. And death through sin, and thus, or by this being death spread to all men because all sin. In other words, the great law of heredity plays part, and once Adam became sinful, he could only impart a sinful nature to his children. Now, there are people today who believe that a child is not sinful until it commits his first wrong action, which I don't accept at all. In fact, we go through Romans chapter 5 a little further, we find that Paul confirmed this point again and again. So, read verse 17, please. Romans 5. Yeah. For if by one man the fence death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through the one, Jesus Christ. And verse 18 and 19, too, please. Therefore, as though one man the fence judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, even so though one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Thank you very much. In verse 18, for therefore through one man's effect judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. So the sin of Adam has brought condemnation to every member of the human family. From the point of conception on, we are born or proceed in sin. Are we working? Now, we start again to take a time, we'll start again. Let's sing a hymn while the technician gets himself sorted out. <laughs> well, I guess the equipment sorted out. <laughs> Something sorted out. Thank you. Let's try 633, three, shall we? Uh -oh. Sound like action, doesn't it? Six three three. Is it going now? Yeah. Sounds like it is. Okay, we're watching it then. Hold six five three three. <laughs> we start again now. Let's repeat that for us. Right. 
Right. Thank you very much. To one man namely Adam, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because of all sin. Which comes first, sin or death? Sin. So when you see death, you see what? The, the presence of sin already. And so the law of heredity sin passed from Adam to Jesus from right over the present time. This is further confirmed in verses 17 to 19. If you have to read it, please. 17 to 19. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. The first and second Adam is an operation. The first one brings sin, the second one brings eternal life. Now in verse 18 we're told that through one man's uh, offence judgment can fall, resulting in condemnation. In other words, every member of the human is judged as being unfit for heaven by virtue of Adam's sin back in the Garden of Eden. Now I stress this point because there are folks today out there in the world who believe that a baby is innocent or born innocent and in main such until he commits his first wrong action. But he commits his first wrong action because first of all he is wrong himself. His first wrong action is a fruit of, his, of what he is, of his being. It doesn't make him to be a sinner but it's because he already is a sinner. Okay. Now let's go to Ephesians 5, the second chapter again. And I'd like to now make some Reduce some points to go to child salvation, which is quite important right here. Now, we know that an adult person is given the, is given the assurance he, he doesn't need to sin by virtue of Christ's life upon this earth. Now, Christ did not sin, so we don't need to sin either, do we? His life proves that. Now, if Christ is the example for, par for parents and, and older folk, in be, in be that only as he had in himself a divine nature to have human flesh. A combination of many humanity was the secret of his victory. Now, if Christ as a man gained the victory because of that, then how did Christ the child gain the victory? Same way precisely. Now, as a child, as a baby, even before he was actually born, he had in his human nature the divine nature. He was God in the flesh, divinity, humanity. Right? And that's the secret of his success as a Christian at a very early age, and why he never even by a thought committed sin from his earliest days up. Now, if Christ as a babe is a picture of what our bab babies can be, then what must our babies have if they're going to be successful in the battle against sin? They must have divinity in their humanity, must they? They must have. That's so clear and simple and fundamental, it's, it's hard to understand what we're going to struggle for, isn't it? It's very, very clear, straightforward and simple to say the least of it, if we miss the point altogether. So when we try and bring up a child, train a child who is not born again, we are fighting against an, a perverse nature. In fact, I think you find people uses the word spirit of disobedience somewhere in the next few verses. Let me see, uh, see if I can find it the children of disobedience. Which verse? Children. Yeah. Verse 2, children of disobedience. Yes, the spirit of the spirit. Now we're in the children. Right, thank you. That's what we're looking for here, the spirit. The spirit of now works in the sons of disobedience. Right, now that spirit is there because of their inheritance. And whilst there, of course, you attempt to train such a child the right way, you're trying to force a naturally disobedient child to obey. Which is like trying to force a, a thorn bush to produce apples or grapes or figs or something decent instead of thorns. And uh, I, I realise that the worst possible combination for a child growing up is to have a Christian born again parent in him as a very spirit of obedience trying to train a child in him as a spirit of disobedience that's the worst possible combination 
Women's Service Plan points out. I'll just stress the point that this boo or this message began with the discovery of this principle that the new birth involves the eradication of the old man, the man of sin, and is replaced with the man of righteousness, which of course is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The same as a thorn which is rooted out to give place to the apple tree instead. So now, in dealing with this problem, we find that uh, we have death reigning in our bodies, which are also in themselves dead. And how does God cope with these two distinct problems? Let's take the flesh first of all. How does God cope with the flesh problem? The flesh is left to build character. Yes, for the moment, but eventually, what's the eventual solution? It must be destroyed. It must be destroyed, right? It must go. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 for a moment, and uh, we will read about that. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50, down to verse, I think, verse 58. <coughs> what do you have it? <coughs> First Corinthians 15, 15, verse 50 to 58. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have been put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, forasmuch as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you very much. There's coming a time when the trumpet shall sound, then there will be a great change in the raising of the dead, incorruptible, immortal, and fit to dwell again in the heavenly paradise. And when this takes place, then to be brought to pass the same as with the death is swallowed up in victory. When the sin came, it attacked three vital elements in man's, in man's nature and also in his surroundings. Man has a spiritual nature and a physical nature and a physical home. And the physical home, of course, was this earth. The, I mean, the, is the home. The physical body, of course, is our, is our human nature, and the spiritual, of course, was the implanted character of God. Now, note that each of these three were given in a certain order. Firstly, God gave us the world, the home. Secondly, He gave us a body, and thirdly, He gave us life in that body. It was a sequence. Now, because of sin, each of these must pass away completely and be replaced now by a new nature altogether. For instance, at the end of a thousand years, what happens to our earthly home? Before that. We destroy. Destroyed. Oh, it's destroyed. First comes total destruction. The new heavens and the new heavens <coughs> will not be modified and put the old one. It will be a total new uh, production. First of all, the old will be absolutely destroyed totally and completely and, and irretrievably consuming a tremendous fire which will engulf the entire world and then God will recreate a new heaven and a new earth which will be new all the way from the ground up so there's a clear cut picture that of first the old must pass away and in turn the new must take its place now what about this mortal body in which we find ourselves in camp at the present time does God modify it? that's no. why why that is it's destroyed completely and we replaced life by, by a new body altogether. Now let's come to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 and uh, in the spiritual realm the same procedure is followed out by God here 
dealing with the situation of nature as well. Because of course there's a very well known scriptish you all be able to quote this I'm sure. So read it please, second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen. Therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Right. Thank you. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, the better translation put this. It's stronger than uh, saying preacher, or it means the same thing actually. So the new creation, not a modified improvement of the old, right? A new creation altogether, not a renovation, but a complete construction, new construction. Old things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. Now it's important, of course, we limit this verse to what, 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 what is applied to at this point, because at the point of new birth are uh, literally all things taken away and all things become new. We have a new body, a new, a new uh, flesh and blood tabernacle. Mm-hmm. And we don't. This verse applies three times. Today, in respect to our spiritual revelation. Shortly, in respect to our physical uh, salvation when the body is renewed. And thirdly, in the thousand years when the earth is again made new at that point of time. Let's now take the verse to apply to each of these three situations. First one, the new earth. Old things have passed away, will be true. All things become new. And a new creation. That's true, isn't it? At the end of a thousand years. Come to the body of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, old things have passed away. Much of your question that way remains. None of it. All things become new. To get a new body entirely. Good news, isn't it? Yes. think about first aches and pain and short lived existence, it's good news to have an immortal body. And it will be a new creation, okay? Now, coming to the new birth experience, and when it says all things have, uh, all things have passed away, what, what has passed away in the new birth experience? The old carnal mind, the old man who sinned, the stony heart. And so on. Did all things become new? How much is new in the, in the Christian spiritual experience? Everything, right? Because we receive the seed of Christ, and in the seed of Christ is a total son of Christ's life and character. So, if we limit that verse, second Corinthians 5 17 to those three instances, we have no difficulty to understand what it means. So then, going back to Ephesians 2, verse 1. We find then that uh, you he has made a life who were dead in trespasses and sins, and life takes the place of death, and we then begin to walk in the ways of God. I'd like, I'd like to stress the point too from John the sixth chapter, John chapter six, that uh, when we are given this life, it is literally eternal life. So eternal life dwells in our mortal bodies. And when Christ is upon this earth, when Christ is upon this earth, did he have in his mortal flesh immortal divinity? He did it right. <coughs> and likewise, the born again Christian has in his mortal flesh immortal divinity. He is God, he is the divine nature dwelling in, in, in human flesh and blood. Let's read this down in John 6 and verse 47, first of all. Someone please. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. So what shall we have? What does it say there? Everlasting life. We have it. He has it. It's present tense. In fact, the uh, life you see in the new birth experience is the only everlasting life you ever get, spiritually speaking. When you die, go to the God again and waste until the resurrection the morning. But that is your reclamation from sin. And that everlasting life that you now have is the only one you'll ever have. You may say, well... That sounds a bit disappointing because I don't find myself radiant and powerful and uh, mighty with this, uh, <coughs> this everlasting life which I've got, or you say I've got. But you must realize, of course, that the instrument through which that light shines is a very poor instrument. That, that's the modifying factor in the whole matter. Now, for instance, um, we have some electric lights in this little building, and uh, they're, they're quite small lights compared to some powerful searchlights and beams that are produced by electricity. 
But the same current that uh, brings us this feeble light flows through the big searchlight and gives a brilliant light, doesn't it? No change in the current. And we can put 15 white globes up there, you hardly get hardly the light at all, just a little dull glimmer of light like moonlight in the room, especially at night time, of course. Likewise, your present spiritual nature has to operate through and find expression through a very poor vehicle or instrument in this old human body. Very poor indeed. I didn't, I didn't persuade you at that point, do I? <laughs> but in the new earth state, of course, we have extremely efficient bodies, powerful, mental, physical, and spiritual bodies, with tremendous capacities, and, and, and it, it will certainly bring forth far better works than it does today. Let's now take some more verses in John 6 chapter to, to, to impress this point on our minds. Uh, I usually get my old Bible joke and find this more quickly, but uh, just go to the verses off hand, maybe some of you folks can see them, but uh, Jesus repeatedly said that uh, anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, I'll raise up the last day. And uh, that's been under 54. 54. Thank you very much. Read it, please. 53 says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up. In the last, at the last day. And verse 58, please. 58. This is the bread which came from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. Yet this bread shall live forever. Mm-hmm. So Christ emphasized the point again and again that the child of God does have the life of God now, and that life, of course, is eternal life. If you think back to the seed principle, the presentation we had a few years ago now, in the new birth experience, it's achieved by the marriage of Christ to the believer. And upon that marriage, Christ implants his seed, within which, of course, is the capsule of his entire nature and character in the believer. So we have the actual perfection of Christ in our flesh and blood, bodies, and natures. And that, and that life of Christ, of course, can be nothing else than immortal. Christ cannot impart a mortal life, he can only impart an immortal life. Because the law of Eurydice says a father can produce, can impart only what he himself is. How could an immortal father impart a mortal inheritance? How could he do that? How could an immortal father impart a mortal inheritance? Is it possible? That's no, not impossible. It's not possible at all. So this is going back to Ephesians again right now. And, um, let's let the message for these people. So when it says, you he made alive with the trespasses and sins, this is an extremely precious and very wonderful statement indeed. And uh, that life in you is the hope of glory. His presence in us is the assurance of divine power and blessing and the victory over sin and of our resurrection from the dead. You see what find there in Desire of Ages it's in the chapter of Christ in Galilee where it like talks about uh, how we should come forth in the resurrection of the morning. I've always found this a very challenging and beautiful statement in the page 388 of the Desire of Ages 388 the paragraph which begins verily verily I say unto you he that believes in me hath everlasting life verily verily I say unto you he that believes on me hath everlasting life through the beloved John who listened to these words the Holy Spirit declared to the churches this is the record became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. It is by virtue of this union that we are to become are to come forth from the grave, not merely as a, as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but because through faith his life has become ours. 
those who seek Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal. Now, what a wonderful step this is. Now, does Christ, or would Christ, or does Christ have the power to speak and call forth from the grave the sleeping saints? Well, he does, but he goes beyond that. And um, it's because his love has become ours that we come forth from the grave. Let's read those words again. It's, it is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave, not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but, but because through faith his life has become ours. Let's turn to Great Controversy now, page 644. And, and here is a... Um, the description of the actual resurrection today when Christ will speak the words and the dead will hear his voice and live. 644, the paragraph begin with admit the reeling of the earth, the flash of lightning, the roar of thunder, etc. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flash of lightning, and the roar of thunder, the voice of the Son of God calls forth the sleeping saints. He looks upon the graves of the righteous. Then, raising his hands to heaven, he cries, Awake, 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 ye that sleep in the dust, and arise. Throughout the length and breadth of the earth, the dead shall hear that voice, and they that hear shall live. Thank you. This is mine. Now, don't ask me to explain the mechanism of this wonderful thing. But the word says, throughout the length and breadth of the earth, the dead shall hear that voice, and they that, they, they that hear shall live. The dead shall hear that voice, and they that hear shall live. Now, how can the dead hear a voice? <coughs> now, can they? They can't. Not, not even God's voice uh, can be heard by the dead as far as their understanding is concerned. But the living life force which Christ brings back with him, which is your real nature and person, or not person so much your real nature, is still very much alive. And in some wonderful way, when Christ speaks and says, Come forth from the grave, that voice is able to reach the mind or the hearing of those who have died in the faith of Jesus and we come forth from the grave in response to that voice. Don't ask me how, but that's the fact of the case. Which demonstrates again, of course, the vital necessity of having the life of Christ in the believer, doesn't it? If you have that life, you're going to be resurrected. That, that life, of course, is, begins right now. Going back to the desire of ages, um, 388, the last sentence of the paragraph, it is through the Spirit of Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal, right? And the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of the life eternal. Think about that for a moment. Now, the life eternal is everlasting life, which is not life which is here today and gone on back again the next day. It's here eternally from this point of time out. So here's a picture then of when we receive the spirit in our hearts and lives, that's the beginning of the life eternal. In other words, you then receive life which is going to last how long? Eternal. Eternally, everlastingly. No end to it, no finish to it. So right now, you're enjoying eternal life, which is the presence of the spirit in you if you're a born again child of God. And that means, of course, that uh, uh, on the great resurrection morning, if we should die in the meantime, we will qualify to answer the voice of Christ and rise from the dead and go with him back to the heaven and kingdom for eternal living up there. So when Paul says, you have been made alive, he certainly stands in a very wonderful and company to, to the believers in Ephesus and to us at the present time too. Because being made alive is to be delivered from death and to be a part and parcel of the family of God. Let's move on now to verse 2 in Ephesians chapter 2. Some of the readers, please. Christians. 
and uh, their course of action in response to their what they were, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit which now works in the sons of disobedience. You may recall when we preached the child salvation message, we talked a lot about the spirit of obedience, the spirit of disobedience. Remember that? And uh, this thought is expressed here, the spirit who now works in the sons of obedience. Now, in what way does that spirit, which of course is Satan's spirit, work in the sons of disobedience? First of all, there's a natural disposition to disobey his name, which is rebellion, transgression, iniquity, trespassing, and so on. And to that person in whom is present, the spirit of disobedience comes the enemy to stir up, to activate, to put into action and to, and to stimulate and develop misdeeds, misconduct, deeds of hatred, pride, malice, bitterness, transgression, and so forth. Now, if they were left to himself without the tempter, things would be bad enough, but with the tempter there, of course, they're much, much worse than these. Um, now, they talk about lust here in verse 3 in particular. What, what is lust uh, versus the satisfaction of need for uh, desires or uh, satisfactions? What, what is lust? Further desires. Further desires, right? Gratification of the flesh in a wrong way. Because we, we either gratify the flesh. Gratify, of course, not quite the word to use for the flesh because. Uh, for instance, when you get hungry, you desire food. Is that in itself necessarily, necessarily simple? No. no. It's not. You eat to gratify your appetite, so you lose a hunger feeling and you don't starve to death. So the word gratification is not quite the best word to use in that respect, but lust is where you seek the satisfactions of eating, drinking, whatever else, just for the sake of that gratification. You eat to live, but this is eating for pleasure. And of course, as far as the world is concerned, today as well as back then, of course, its whole accent, its whole emphasis, its whole desire, its whole works is on the gratification of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. If you spend a moment in the newspaper, the television, or billboards down the street, what is the appeal being made to people all over the world at the present time? Lust of the flesh. Flesh, fleshly lust, right? <laughs> this wonderful new food, this exciting, uh, feeling you're going to get if you smoke a cigarette. It's one of the new tastes, this glamorous new dress or clothing. And uh, in every direction, the merchants are appealing to the sensual part of man's nature, and the world is following on with rapid pace. Now, is this true back in Paul's day in Ephesus as well? Absolutely. absolutely. Nothing, nothing one of the fashion capitals of the world in that day. And every sinful practice was offered to people in that great metropolis of Ephesus back then. Now, what is wrong with gratifying these appetites and passions? After all, God gave them to us, didn't He? It becomes sin. It becomes sin. It brings out self. It covers the spiritual. It the spiritual. James, James says, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. Sin, and sin brings forth death. Yes. Right. We should, know, we should know the reasons for these, uh, these questions because. Uh, we're, we're then better versed in avoiding it, we become sealed intellectually against the temptation to indulge in these things. Now, let's take them one by one. Let's take dress, for instance. When dress becomes your idol and uh, you you the latest fashions and so forth, who becomes the center of your attention and service? Self. Self does, right? And that leads to pride. Pride leads to separation from God. To self sufficiency and separation from God. And separation from God leads to ill health and to death. Sure, right. And um, when you indulge your appetites in, 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 in unhealthy food just for the sake of the taste, you are destroying yourself literally. And uh, also, your very nature becomes inflamed, your, your nervous system becomes inflamed, your appetites and passions become uh, distorted, and so on. And you then practice more and more of those habits which actually destroy <coughs> you from your soul and spirit. So the, the, actual, the actual effect of, of living according to the lust of this world is to destroy yourself bit by bit and piece by piece. Now, this means you'd expect that in the world today there'd be a correlation between the present 
pursuit of fashion and the lust of the flesh and the world's ill health. Let's say, first of all, that today we have the greatest manifestation of uh, lustful pursuit or history. And what else do we have? The greatest sickness, epidemics, incurable diseases, and so forth, rampaging the world. In fact, we've got incurable diseases now that can't even cure, like cancer and AIDS, for instance. So, therefore, I believe to actually avoid uh, living the life of the world, we have to be persuaded in our mind that it is actually destructive harmful and demoralizing and degenerative. So it's not enough to simply say it's wrong, we must know why it's wrong to avoid it and be still against it. And certainly in the city of Ephesus, Paul could point to these things being in existence back there in a strong and powerful way. Now, having looked at what they were and what they had been doing in the past, we now move on to verse 4 to 10 to a description of what had happened in the great change which had taken place in them because of the living power of a living God, the almighty gospel which poured forth to them. So we'd like to read somebody please from verse 4 to 10, Ephesians, the second chapter. But God, who was rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Thank you very much. Now, what a, what a tremendous recital of what God has done for these people and what God in turn is doing for us through the same gospel of Jesus Christ today. The first of all, verse 4 outlines the motivation of God, the reason why he has, he has given us his salvation. Now, it's interesting to see how you can how you can misquote the Bible, misunderstand it. Let's go back now and uh, present a possible other reason why God should be interested in saving this world. Now, when Satan rebelled up in heaven and was cast out of the great, wonderful paradise above, and this earth below, he set up a situation which had to be solved at any price. Of course, only the righteous price as far as God is concerned. Now, had God been, God could, for instance, have simply sat, sat back and said, okay, I've given all your angels warning of what would happen if you sin. Now, just sit back and I'll let it happen, and you'll all be convinced that sin is not profitable. Could God have done that? <coughs> I mean, I'm, I'm talking mechanically, not, uh, we know it's very hard to love, he couldn't. His love is so strong, he could he just couldn't do that. But apart from that factor, from a cable point, you could go have adopted that course. Yes. Certainly he could have died. Right? Now, he didn't do that. Instead, he, because if God had left this problem unsolved, then he would have been seen quite correctly as, as an inadequate problem solver, as less than infinite. This would have caused the angels to have lost all faith in him entirely, and that would have that, that then extended the rebellion throughout the entire universe. So in his own interests, to save the rest of the universe, what did God have to do? Solve the problem. So it could be argued that God did this from a selfish point of view, couldn't it? Could be argued that way. But a little deeper thought shows, of course, that's a very false argument to entertain in regard to God's character. Now, for instance, if God, if God was selfish, if he could have sat back and said, all right, I'll, I'll let the thing run its course, I'll let it wipe out all the angels, I'll start again. I'll not get that kind of power. I mean, if you if you, if you had a million dollars and you probably lost one dollar, would you care about it? You wouldn't care a button, would you? And uh, if you had the printing press and could print money, <laughs> create money, then you wouldn't care if you lost ten million dollars, you'd just print some more. That's what that, 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 that was God's situation. It is true, of course, that God did uh, act to solve the problem so as to preserve the entire universe, but at the same time, there was some love and mercy that he, that he did come to mankind with salvation. 
Let's read that thought again in verse 4. That God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. That was the motivation, the motivation of love. It's perhaps a little difficult for mankind, generally speaking, to think of God as a loving God because they tend to look upon him as they, as they look upon their own potentates and rulers and earthly emperors and dictators and prime ministers and presidents and so forth are very self-serving people. They're powerful and they're first considerations for themselves. And they distance themselves from their people. You never see them visiting the local people. They, 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 they live high above in some great mansion that's tucked away in its own little corner. And uh, we tend to think of God in that same light. In fact, the Babylonians declared that there was, there was a situation with God. Let's go back to Daniel in the second chapter of the moment, just briefly, and uh, note the scripture there, which is the testimony of Babylon in regard to the distance of God from his people. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 11, please. And it is rare thing that the king is and there is none other that can show it before the king except God's whose realm is not with flesh. <clears throat> so the God, the Babylonian God does not go where? With flesh. With flesh. He's distant. He's, he's separate from his people. But we are to understand that God is one of us and one with us. In fact, Emmanuel means God with us and our God is a loving God who likes to, family, <coughs> to be family with his people. He is our Father in the truest sense of that word. And though we know that, of course, the happy we're going to be. So I greatly appreciate the fact that God is indeed Father, friend, and cohabitor with us in the universe. We shall see his face in the very near future. The time is running out again, so I'll stop at this point. Stay for a little while. Any, any questions or points you'd like to ask or add? Yes, Mary. Um, I have one. Um, back when we were looking at John chapter 6, John chapter 6, talking about the eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood. Right. The passages we read were focusing on the fact that when we <clears throat> eat that flesh and drink that blood, Christ dwells in us. And I don't deny that. But my question is, where does this fit in? Um, verse uh, 56 says, He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. And I don't hear that much you know, being said about dwelling in him. And I just wonder, where exactly does that fit in? How does it fit in? Sure. Once, we, once Christ is in us, then we enter his family and become one in him as well. So that just simply means we're in his family and that he dwells in us? And the essential thing is, of course, that Christ must dwell in us. That's the new person. Without that, we're lost. Once we have that essential, then we then we have adopted the God's family and become brothers with Christ. We're in, 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 in his family in him. Okay, so which one's first? Or is there a first or a second? Well, uh, first of all, we do recognize that uh, Christ vicariously covers every person for the time being until he makes his mind, but the actual dwelling in, uh, Christ dwelling in you is a starting point of Christian experience. That's the starting point. Well, I'm just trying to relate in my own mind because the, the abiding in the vine, you have to abide in the vine before the life of the vine can abide in you. So there's, there's something about Yeah, it's true, but the, 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 the vine parable doesn't talk about the new birth, it talks about Christian experience. You see, the, the, the new birth is pictured by a thorn bush, not by a vine. The thorn bush is rooted out and replaced by, by a vine or a fig tree or whatever. And when Christ spoke about the about the vine, he mentioned the initial entry into his family and talked about abiding in him after you become a Christian. Yes, Frank. I always looked at it this way in John chapter 6, verse 56. It says, He that eats my flesh and drinks my blood dwells in me and I in him. Mm -hmm. The important thing then is to make sure that we're eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And the other two things follow that. That's the cause. Well, you can't really eat his flesh and blood until you become born again. The reaction to doing it makes you born again Christian initially. Once you become born again Christian, it's 
same one that you can tell the people you can thus draw the life and ocean from. It must be, must be a living connection made, of course. Yes. in us as a result of the new birth that hears Christ call us at the second coming and it comes forth. What brings forth the wicked? If they don't have an answering cord within them, what brings them up? Well, could it not... As I said, you can say, I can't explain this wonderful thought, but it's written there the line. It's true, Bible that we come forth in response to Christ's call. But the righteous come forth immortal, that life is never die. Whereas with the wicked, their life is at a certain period. Yeah, the question was how they have it. Yes, I know, but as you say, it's recreated. There's a different time. Like, like when Jesus, after he died, his father called him because he, that life was already there, you know, when he died. Yeah. So I, I, I see the, the righteous coming forth in that same way. Yeah, that's quite true. That's quite true. It's true indeed. But um, it's very sad. You've made a problem in, in your question because... Uh, it means that Christ is going to recreate wicked people in their wickedness. And he wouldn't do that. You wouldn't think so, would you? No. Well, well, the, the, the point Jesus, is this. Jesus rose people from the dead, you know, when he was on earth. And, and like that uh, the lady from the name, was it? The his son? son. His son well, there was no, I don't know whether he was a Christian or not. It never really said as such. <laughs> Well, there are some problems there, Mary, which we don't have the answer from the present time. We're probably quite careful about that, but uh, it, it, it is clear that wicked shall be raised. And they will not come forth in response to Christ's voice as, as the righteous do. So it appears that Christ is going to re resurrect by his creative power wicked folk in their wickedness. Can I offer a potential concept? Sure. Okay. In uh, Romans 5, we all admit that when Adam sinned, that we're all accounted as having sinned because we were there in God's eyes. He sees us there in Adam. It's more than a count, it's a fact. Well, okay, it's a fact. We know it's a fact because of the fact that we all reap the same death. Yeah. We all die, okay? Now, Christ, having lived that righteous life, he's the second Adam. Is it not possible God sees all of us in, at, in Christ, having lived that righteous life, and as a result, the fact is everyone will rise. Because of that, and that's this justification of life, God has given it to every man. The question is, is what are you doing with that life? And that's those who will be made righteous versus those who will, will not. Those who will rise in the first resurrection versus those who will rise in the second. That, that life will hear God's voice, but the question is, is which resurrection will you come up in? And there's a statement in Isaiah where it says that there is Satan holds in prison, his prison house his prisoners when Christ comes, which means Satan doesn't let them come forth 
that they hear his voice, but they can't come forth. But if at the second resurrection, Satan would certainly want them to come up because he needs his army. I mean, it's just a, you know, potential concept. That's potential. I've been thinking about that one for a while. Okay, that's all. Any other questions? Yes. yes. life. 
abide in me and I in you. I mean, this is the line to illustrate the initial new birth and also living constantly, drawing sap from the living vine. Well, no, the vine doesn't really need to show the new birth because there's no, no picture there of something being taken out and something being put in. No, but it shows the initial connection. Yeah. It refers back to that, sure. But the full story of the initial connection is I've been told you have a thorn bush being rooted out from one day to place. What's what you got to say is I say is I break the law is my stem. We we don't find anything being taken down first in that particular situation. The kind of talking about the people of the church is talking about the progressive connection with Christ to say that they will sustain that spiritual life. our born again experience okay in Galatians chapter 3 verses verse 27 and 28 it says for as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ could it not be that our focus had been so strong on putting in Christ that we're really not seeing the full significance of putting on Christ because the baptism is putting on and we focused on baptism being putting in could it not be that there's something in here we're not yet catching well, that's true, all scripture. Well, I grant you. So maybe, maybe we really ought to look into this putting on Christ at our baptism rather than so much focus on putting in Christ at our baptism. Because there's something more in our very new birth that we have yet to understand. Well, and that we baptism, of course, is um, putting on Christ in the sense that Christ then enters into and dwells in you and in the government of the of his presence. And naturally, of course, that is also the initiative that we establish in the well, I guess the reason I'm concerned is because you have stressed over and over, and I really, you know, to a certain extent, believe this. There are proper procedures, or proper ways that, you know, when we're ignorant, we can pass through these without even knowing what we're doing. Okay, but as we learn, we learn there are steps, and it's just it's coming across to me that in Christ comes before. Christ in us. I'm seeing that concept, and I'm wondering how, how do we really put them together? Let's take the fun. Because Christ in you comes first. Then you enter into the Christ family of life. I could. Yeah. Like, I just studied it up a little bit. I can't find it in here in Sister in the Desire of Ages, but she talks about the way you're talking about in Christ is being in him by faith. Mm -hmm. When you're in him by faith, then you receive the seed of Christ. Okay. Well, then faith in Christ has to come before the life can come in us. Well, so, so, so sort of the same. It's almost right one after the other. Right? Well, I, I agree. They're almost simultaneous. Yeah, but where should our focus be? Putting Christ in us or putting our faith in Christ? I think the result of one is the result of another. In other words, if you have a, an open cylinder and you drop that into the water, the result of that will be into the water. It has the water going what? into it, right? Right? If you have your focus on going into Christ, automatically Christ will be coming into you, right? Right. So the result of one is going to be the result of the other. How you cannot be in Christ without having Christ in you. Right. So I guess what I maybe you know what's what I was in this moving only about a year when I found myself focusing so much on getting Christ into me that I recognized I was losing the fact that that only happens as my faith in Christ grew and and so I was beginning to I just felt like I was losing concept of where I should be in my faith as far as while putting myself into Christ, therefore allowing that life to come into me. And I just felt like, you know, there's something here that just wasn't quite gelling. At least from my experience, it was. We're living in the presentment of faith in Christ. Well, obviously, faith in Christ must come because you kind of, you look, you know that having faith in Christ. Obviously, not faith in Him. Not really a 
Não, é que fala. Six thirty to nine. <coughs> <coughs> 